speaker who, as a doctor, uh, as Mr. Dr. Danish said, that putting trying to put some sanity to the <laughs> to the insanity of uh, of uh, water, water politics in Pakistan, is uh, Dr. Hassan Abbas. He's a scientist and social activist. Uh, has an extensive research and industry experience in water resource, resource evaluation, hydrological field investigations, climate change, environmental instrumentation, hydrometry, civil engineering works, GIS applications, groundwater modeling, environmental modeling, data analysis through massive databases and project management. <coughs> Dr. Abbas has worked on different regions of the world, including the Great Lakes Basin in USA and Canada, Murray Darling Basin, Australia, Hunter River Valley, Australia, Indus River Basin, and Makran Coast Belt, Pakistan, Euphrates Tigris Basin, Iraq, and Riyadh Central Province, Saudi Arabia, and Doha, Qatar. Dr. Abbas did his Bachelor in Civil Engineering from National University of Science and Technology in Pakistan, Masters in Hydrology and Groundwater Management from University of Technology, Sydney, Australia, and PhD in the field of Hydrology and Water Resources from Michigan State University. So we are honored that he is ever with us. Please stop. Thank you. Congress for giving me a chance to speak for the first time in my life in the United Kingdom, England and London. Uh, I won't uh, say any more words of introduction. Uh, straight away coming to this one, that uh, Indus River Basin has been a source of conflict. Uh, for last at least 150 years. The, the conflict and the resentment of Sindh province began with the British authorities all the way back in the 1850s when the first major works of river diversions were started uh, in, uh, on, on the Indus Basin. The first one was uh, Madhupur Canal followed by uh, Sindhind Canal and Sindh objected to those. And since then, those works are taking place and Sindh is objecting, and not just Sindh is objecting, but there is a conflict between upstream and downstream, whether it is Sindh or within Sindh or within Punjab, upstream and downstream conflicts are there and they are always there and they are, they are not going anywhere. Now the problem is that we want to use waters for our benefit. And one of the benefits, other than just drinking water and producing food, is making some money out of it, using it as an economic engine for us. And to use water as an economic engine, you have various economic models that you can apply to the river to use it as an economic engine. And most of the models or I would say almost all of the models which have been applied in Indus River Basin are the ones which create conflicts. But there are other models that we'll talk about as we go, which instead of creating conflicts, uh, create peace and unity. And when I say paradigm shift or a new paradigm, this is what I want to like start talking. I'm, I'm not saying it's going to happen anytime soon, but at least we should start talking about those paradigms which actually convert a river system into an instrument of peace rather than conflict and discord. What you will be looking during my presentation is not just my work. Uh, we are a small but highly qualified integrated team. We all work together and these are three of my major colleagues who have done a lot of work in the slides that you would subsequently see during this presentation. And because they are not here with me, but I want to acknowledge my work and want to want you to have a little bit of introduction 
about these three guys who are working uh, together with you. Now, Indus is often called a mighty Indus river. Look at this one. This is a Google image, and this river is Indus. Uh, the stretch covered in this picture is about 10 miles or so. Look at the mountains. These are mountains. They are not small ridges. These are mountains. The mountains are aligned like this, and the river is cutting them through. Now, that speaks of the strength of Indus. All the small little rivers of the world, they flow between the ridge lines, not across them. They don't cut it. But these mountains are younger than the Indus. Indus was there before these mountains, and these mountains have risen to quite some height, but Indus did not leave its space. That made this river a very mighty river, and that tells us how robust is the geological, hydrological, and earth energy system, which is actually bringing water into this river and making it run. Water is not going to go away from Indus anytime soon. Now this is the watershed of Indus. You see this part, Nimodo, this one, this is Ganga Jamna Basin, and this all is Indus River Basin, all the tributaries, and ultimately Indus joins the sea here at Sin Delta, in District Hatta and Badin. Now this small little canal here, this was the first major works of, uh, I would say, mega proportions, which were undertaken uh, near the Indus River system. This canal was built 13 and 1358, uh, quite some years ago. And after that, the next major works were undertaken in 1633. Again, massive undertaking. Now this is that canal, those who are familiar with the city of Lahore, this was the canal which was built by Shah Jahan to bring water to Shalimar Gardens, which are very historical gardens, and water supply of Lahore. Then, when the British were ruling, they developed this canal in 1789, 1879 as an irrigation canal command. Before these two major canals, there were inundation canals. That it is when the river naturally gets more water, these canals would also get water. And when the river is running low, these canals don't get any water. But British, for the first time, brought those locking gates. And they put those locking gates on the river and remodeled this canal to become a canal command area. And this was an economic success and a social success, and it served quite a few colonial purposes. Then, you just keep watching the years and keep looking at the map, and one project after the other of massive proportions keeps coming in. This is now the 20th century starts, and at the start of 20th century, this is the amount of plumbing which has been done. Now, Danish was showing you those straight pipes and lines and stuff. That's how they figure it out in the uh, decision-making circles. But this is what is the ground reality. This is how those projects are spreading out. And this is like 118 years ago. But things didn't stop here. More, more. They keep coming. And you see all those projects, they are coming in the upper parts. Now, even if you take one drop of water from upstream, it will have some impact on delta. It's simple mass balance. And Sin was rightly objecting to all these projects. There is history on this. Then massive undertaking. This 1927 was a massive undertaking, triple canal project and stuff. You can find more about these projects in the history books. And this was the first project which was done in Sindh. This was Sakhar Baraj. Now, uh, because Sindh was always objecting, so this was given as a bribe to Sindh, that okay, we will build one for you too. So this was the first Baraj which was built in Sindh. And this Baraj was largest of all which was built before it. More, more. And then comes 1947, 
when India and Pakistan were divided, and this was the boundary line which divided India and Pakistan. Now you see this massive irrigation system which had been developed so far was also divided by this line. And uh, 1948, India shuts a few canals which were feeding into Pakistan and that was where the water wars between India and Pakistan started. <coughs> now this yellow part is all the canals which were closed. And this was this became a bone of contention between the two countries. But look at these the, the, the size of this area. In isolation, this is a big area. But compared to the rest of the system, it was not more than 10%. Now, in order to resolve this 10%, Pakistan decided to give three rivers to India without consulting the lower riparians who were here. Nobody consulted them. And they decided that, okay, in order to get this area back, we give three, three eastern rivers to India. This was also an area which could go out of uh, irrigation if the rivers are fully diverted. But India did not have any capacity to divert the rivers. Therefore, this was still running and available to Pakistan and only that much of area was actually impacted. Then India made it clear to Pakistan that they want to con get full control of the three eastern rivers and they will not let Pakistan use their waters and Pakistan should make some diversions from the western rivers into these canals and let them go. And then uh, started a bunch of mega structural interventions on both sides of the border. India to divert the rivers and Pakistan to retrofit its existing rivers in order to supply water uh, to its existing irrigation system. And ultimately, when all those things were going on, after 12 years of conflict, a treaty was signed which is called Indus Basin Treaty. Now, in this Indus Basin Treaty, uh, I have just masked the works which were done in India, but you can see, before the Indus Basin Treaty was signed, uh, this, these canals were being impacted and all these works were completed by India. Now, these red markings are basically the canal irrigation system completed by India after becoming uh, structurally capable of diverting the waters. So these works were done and you see these works are massive. And these red lines that you are seeing uh, within Pakistan, those were the works that Pakistan undertook in order to respond to those things. And up, up, till, up until now, the treaty has not yet been signed. And all those structures are already in place. And now, I just put here uh, between 1948 and 1960, you see the amount of plumbing which was done before signing of the treaty. There was no treaty and both countries were undertaking massive projects. And then post-treaty. Post-treaty, uh, there were so many interlinking canals which are marked with red in Pakistan. So these western rivers were diverting water into the eastern rivers. And India on the other hand was diverting waters into these new canal systems and also creating new canal commands and diverting water from Satraj into Jamna river. And then came the big daddy of all, Bhagra Dam. It was completed in 63. Pong Dam in 1974, Thin Dam in 2001, Mangla in 1967, and Terbela in 1976. So those are all the structures which were built. And during all this time, when all these works were being undertaken, nobody was asking these people what's going to happen to you. So lower riparian were kept out. 
Now, soon after the treaty, these were the works which were carried out on the Pakistani side and Indian side and uh, this is 67, okay, 70 and uh, so back to this one, okay. Now, this is very interesting. This was the situation in 1966. This was the canal command area which was operational and working and producing everything, all the food for Pakistan. And then, today, this is the area. And I have written spot the difference. The only difference is there are two large dams today. There are no dams here. So my point is that if this system all this system was already working with those dams. What did the dams do? Since 1966 till today, there is no significant change in the canal irrigation network for which dams are type touted to be the providers of water. They would always tell you that without these two dams, you would have become barren, you would have become a desert. Pakistan won't exist. Sindh would be a desert, Punjab would be a desert. But why Pakistan was not a desert in 1966 when all this system was working without dams? What did the dams really do? I did not have time to analyze both dams, but I did one. This is the Bela, the biggest of all. World's largest earthfield dam still holds that title. You see, this is, the blue lines are the annual inflow coming in and red is the annual inflow going out. This is the year the dam started operating. More flow is coming in, less is going out and then the very next year more is going out, less is coming in. And then you can see every year the bars are exactly the same, whether there is low flow or there is high flow or there is average flow. So what this dam is doing? It is just taking all the water which is coming in and it is letting it go out. It's not doing anything. They tell you, the dam lobby, they tell you that hey, we always get big floods and the water gets wasted and if we have dams, we will not let it go wasted. But what did the dam, the biggest dam did? It did nothing. And any dam which is now being proposed will do nothing. Well, there's something what these dams are doing. Let's see that one. Now here is seasonal transfer within the year, within the months. Year to year there's no transfer. But within the months, there's some. Here the dam is storing a little bit of water because there's more water coming in. These blue lines are water coming in. So dam is storing this much water. So, now again, this is, by the way, this data is from Bhavda, those who are the custodians of dams through which I have made these graphs. This water is going into canal, these green lines. This is being stored in the dam. And after <coughs> this supply gets less, this much is being supplemented into the canals by the dams. So here you can see very clearly then the contribution of dam is actually not as big or as significant as you are made to believe. Here is a summary of this graph. This is your river flow. This is going to the canals. And this is the contribution of the largest possible dam that you could ever build in Pakistan. Here you would have a fair idea that 6% of intervention in order to achieve that intervention, you gave away three rivers, you did project worth billions of billions of dollars, <coughs> you deprived your downstream communities of their livelihood and so many things that we have seen in the, in the movie that was very nice, nicely composed movie. And uh, I've been to those areas, I've seen those things up, up close and personal, the, the destruction and everything. And then, the worst of all, 
you have created regional conflicts, community conflicts, ethnic conflicts within your own country just to get this advantage. And your efficiency, the, the, this, is, this is the water which you are using to produce food. And you are the most water wasters of the, of the world, the biggest water wasters of the world. Because <coughs> India produces about 30% more crops with the same amount of water. Countries like Egypt and Turkey, they produce about 50% more than us. And countries, advanced countries like Australia and California, they go about 70% more and Israel is doing about twice as much. So if you had invested the same money that you invested here into making this a little bit more crop per drop type of a thing, you would not even need that water. So this is where our priorities and our thinking goes completely skewed. And that's why they say things not worth doing are not worth doing well. Now, you have seen the movie, and here, the obvious impacts. Now here, you can actually see the scale of the operation. This is your Indus Delta, only this much. And this is the impact of all the projects. This is, this is the massive scale which is impacting this small little portion. Now, Indus Delta used to have about 220 million acre feet of water every year. That was the amount of water flowing through this area into the sea, and not just water, but silt and water, and it was maintaining the culture, ecology, geology, and everything of the Delta. Today, that is gone. And now, once that is gone, you are getting, like Danish was saying, it's one, two, one, two, and then they try to average it out and make it look bigger. <coughs> this is an analyzed satellite data image in which you can see two different colors. Those dark red areas are the ones which are completely submerged in water. Uh, and the start of this image is 1984 and the end is 2016. So between 1984 and 2016, what happened? All the red areas, they are completely submerged in seawater and the light red areas are the ones which are seasonally submerged in seawater. Like if your land is now coming under high tide in some high tidal seasons, you can't use that land for any, any good purpose. And it's, it's destined to go. And practically it's gone. And these are the numbers here. This number the years from 84 to 2016, 24 acres per day is being lost in this category and 67 acres per day is being lost in the other category. So this area is about, the, the, the lost area is about half the size of Lebanon. Now Lebanon is an independent country. I was there two days before so I just calculated. Now these are some scenes, you have seen the movie as well. And this is eroding data. Now, you see, this is high tide. And this plant, it grew in freshwater environment. This is a freshwater plant. It is now dry. And you can see on the horizon is, a, is the land. And before, it was uh, land with sweet soil and sweet water. And not too long ago, because the, the, the tree is not a very old one. So that's the kind of, so these are the real scenes of erosion of delta. Whenever the, when the tide is going down, it is eroding it. Erosion gullies and stuff. This is not quite common if you travel in the coastal <coughs> bed. And the cities are not spared. This is seawater intrusion. These are the remnants of a rice mill, which are only visible now in a low tide. And this is the drinking water in your delta. Delta, which was once the sea of fresh water, Today, without those kind of interventions which are done by NGOs and donor agencies, what you and the dogs get is this fresh water, and this is the only fresh water now available to these communities and these animals, and they have to share it. Well, sharing is good. Yeah.
And then there are there are those uh, I would I would always call them cosmetic projects. The people would go and they would say somebody uh, inaugurates this is a children's playground, Katy Bandar. And this is the year is 2007. And uh, I took this picture January this year. Uh, this is playground for children. And the children are playing outside the playground, but not without hope. Those who can read it, they can read it. But it, what it's written is, now we will have a new KT Bandar. Because they are talking about new Pakistan, so they are thinking about new KT Bandar. Hey, That's their term. Hey, hey. And the deserts which are made to bloom. Now this is very interesting. That okay, we know, we know the data is being deprived, but where the water go? All those canal command areas. I would not talk much about the agriculture economy of this. I will only start with the very basic, the drinking water part. First of all, this area, it, it, it received excessive water and that excessive water caused water logging and salinity. So the land which was once very productive, you lost it to salinity and water logging. And this, this is what happened to their towns. And this is the drinking water. Because, you know, those canals were built and taken to the deserts. And deserts were made to bloom. But a desert is a desert because there is no rainfall and the groundwater is brackish or non-existent and that's why nobody lives there and the place is called a desert. When you take a canal to irrigate that desert, that canal water is the only source of fresh water for those communities. And you cannot operate a canal 12 months a year. It has to go down when the water is less in the river. And it has to be closed for at least two months for cleaning and these communities are going through hell when the canal is closed and you go there and the water level is going down it is accumulating all that kind of nasty stuff on it but you have no choice but to drink this water so this is called unsustainability there is a problem to every solution they say there's a solution to every problem, but here the things are reversed. There's a problem to every solution. You see, they brought irrigated water and they caused these two problems. Then they solved these, this problem, water logging and salinity, and they caused these problems. You know? Then they said, okay, we'll have gravity flow without pumps and stuff. This innovation, this had these three problems. You keep going, herbicides and pesticides, because there were too many insects which were coming in. They, they brought in herbicides and pesticides and they had these three problems. Then they created those barrages to divert canals. They had these problems. And then dikes to protect floods, these flood protection works. You know, all those works, all those green lines, behind those green lines are projects, behind those green lines are interest groups, and behind those green lines are loans coming into your country. And somebody is taking a huge advantage from that loan money and the rest of the nation is paying for it. And they call it, we call it economic externalities. And they don't, they don't have any accounting of these red elements in their cost benefit analysis of the projects that they are doing and what they are proposing. And despite those billions of dollars of projects, those treaties and everything, water still remains a flashpoint all across the region. You know, treaty was signed, then they are still threatening each other with war, investments, but population still lives below poverty line. Lower riparian communities are always unhappy and environmental refugees the number of them is increasing with every passing day. So what's the future discourse that we can take? We want to sustain our agriculture because 
Now we are a population of 200 million. We have to eat something in order to live. But we also want to deal with these, these, these crises. And we want to restore our degraded ecosystems. And one of the biggest degraded ecosystems is Indus Delta. Actually, Indus Delta is quite akin to air all sea, but it doesn't get that kind of coverage or that kind of uh, uh, visual uh, appearance in the press and stuff. Otherwise, I mean, if you study closely this, the destruction of Indus Delta, I think this is a story not less than air all sea. But there's a way forward. There's a way forward. Because knowledge has the answers. <coughs> After doing all these right or wrong things, we have learned a lot. And our knowledge base has increased a lot. The tools and the brains which contain those knowledge and who have the ability to use the tools is a lot more than what we had in the, in the 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s. <coughs> so, there are basic principles these days. Now, this is the changing global mind. Once upon a time, like Danish was saying, I am a big man, I will big projects, million acre feet, pouring concrete, dams. Now, the global mind is shifting towards uh, integration. And one of the basic principles which is being applied on every river system is free flow. Contemporary school of thought. This is one of the books which is published by UNESCO. It's a very good one. And there are so many books on this theme that you can get these days. They say water belongs to no one, but to the river, the way it is and where it is. That's the, that's the core principle. And then there are linkages. And there are so many linkages within a given system. And we should know that those linkages are there and we should also know that we do not fully understand those linkages. So this is, this is the time when we are coming out of an age of total ignorance to informed ignorance. Before we didn't even know that we don't know and today at least we know that we don't know. And that would make us way more cautious in our next project. And then go with the flow, it's almost the same point. So this is a conceptual sustainability matrix that this is free flow and this is full structural control and this is the sustainability reader. It's more sustainable, that's unsustainable. Structural control will push you towards unsustainable solutions and this is full adaptation and this is no adaptation. We want to be somewhere here. So that's the, that's the concept. Before you are even thinking of a project, you should have this picture in your mind, where you are going. Then, we have the biggest opportunity in the world to save water. Because we are the, we are the least efficient water users. So in terms of efficiency, we have the biggest opportunity. And Sandra Post Postal actually said that this is last oasis uh, which will bring you more water, which is efficiency. And I think we are the richest in terms of the last oasis. Here it comes. When we apply water for irrigation, uh, we lose water in evaporation and deep drainage and only this water, which is the smallest part of the pipe, is the one that is actually needed by the plants. And this is our opportunity and this is our smiley face. Now efficient irrigation, if we start doing it, uh, as per uh, estimates of many other authors, we can save from 40% to 90% of water in Pakistan that we are currently taking out of our rivers. So if say 60 to 70% water comes back to the rivers, then I don't think so we have any problem with the flowing rivers. because. Currently, we are diverting 104 million acre feet of water out of 140 million acre, acre feet of water for irrigation. And if instead of diverting 104, we are only diverting say 20 to 30, I mean our water woes are a thing of the past. 
And what do these water savings look like? This is our irrigated area, 14 million hectares. And this is all the water that we put on it for irrigation. And this is 130 billion cubic meters or 104 million acre feet. We can do the job with this much water to efficiency. And we can save this much. Now, I say that if we have to achieve this, we have to go one step at a time. We think that we can apply efficiency on half of our area and the possible, out of the possible efficiency, we only achieve half of that efficiency and we are here, then we can save this much water. And this much water, say, we put a goal that we do it in 20 years. So I call it a 50-50 scenario and we can save this much water in 20 years and this is what this saving looks like. This is your total water. This much is currently being diverted to irrigation. This goes into your dams. This goes into the environment. And finally, in 20 years, you can save this much. This one cuts it here and puts it here. So you have more water coming back to the environment. And if we go on another 30 years, in 50 years time, we can conveniently save this much water. It cuts from here goes from here, and here you have the flowing rivers. So if we start thinking on these lines, keeping that matrix and those sustainability principles in mind, it is possible to achieve this thing in 50 years time. After all, we have wrecked our river system over a time span of 150 years. I think it would be reasonable if we get back to normal in 50 years. Then rivers can flow again. So these are the rivers which can flow again. Unfortunately, the other rivers which we, we, we gave to India, we don't have any control on them as yet. And we can create a river and corridor of about 2.5 million hectares. This could be the environmental uh, engine that would clean water, produce fresh air, kind of a mini Amazon in the Indus Basin. All those migratory birds would return and you can have a lot of uh, natural things, fish and frog coming back into the river. But what do we do with the flowing river other than having nature restored? Here we talk about invoking economic engines into your flowing rivers. And there could be many. You can think of so many different economic engines which can actually generate economy for the communities. But we don't put any economic engine on ground unless that economic engine goes through a very rigorous due diligence test. And in this due diligence test, any project that you propose out of these engines, you assess its life cycle cost, then externalities, and then internalities, and then do the last count. But here, I have put this thing highlighted. Impact on Delta. Like in the environmental assessment, in order to see the health of an environment, you pick up an indicative species. Like for example, for cold water streams, you pick up trout. And you count the number of trouts with certain interventions that if the trout population is sustained, that means your system is sustained. If it goes down, you should do something to bring it up. So you take Indus Delta as some kind of an indicative species in order to judge or evaluate any of these projects. So if, if, if there's anything going wrong with the Indus Delta, that means your system is not correct. good. And then finally, I suggested a few things in a project where you can actually do some irrigation here, navigation here, some water supply to Karachi. This was a detailed article. <coughs> and New York Times published a story just yesterday and, and they have actually uh, hyperlinked to this article and they have also quoted me and they have actually quite uh, systematically ridiculed this crowdfunding for them. So this article is worth reading. Please, please read it. I've, I've given you the link as well. And uh, again, this, this is the article and this article, you can actually go here on this link 
and you can uh, see this one. These are three different projects, but presented in an integrated way as a conceptual uh, demonstration of the kind of thinking that is going on these days and, and what we can do. This speaks of our potential. And mighty Indus had historically been navigable. There are so many navigation activities which have taken place on this river and the river is still navigable. This is again, I am putting this statement based on a complete uh, paper which has been, uh, which is under publication, but we, our team has done a lot of research on this and we can share with you as, as uh, so that you know how it is done. And uh, what do a flowing river and a navigating river looks like generally is this one, this is a boat on the Sava River, uh, Belgrade. And these are the people who are living in the uh, in the watershed. These are the river people. And today we have spent billions of dollars in order to dry up our river. And here is a dammed and diverted river close to Katy Bandar. This is the boat. And unfortunately, these are the people. So, so this is the difference between a flowing river and a dammed and diverted river. So dammed and diverted rivers are not making money for you, they are making you poor. They are making you, they are making sure that you do not live a life any more than subsistence. Whereas the flowing rivers, they have much better economy. This is a proven fact in the world. And we want that Indus should be thought of <coughs> on these lines. Any development project that we are thinking or conceiving is conceived on the lines which are like this and not like this. And then if you have navigating rivers, this is my final point, then if you have navigating rivers, it brings regional peace back because who is at the most advantage in this economic model? The person and the community which is connected to the sea. Because inland navigation, the biggest client is the open sea. And they are the biggest beneficiaries. And the ones who are at the who are the upper riparian, they depend on the lower riparian. So this is an economic model which if we adopt, we as a lower riparian can get advantage. But at the same but unlike the other model in which when the low the upper riparian gets advantage, the lower riparian is disadvantaged. Here, when you get advantage, the upper riparian also gets advantaged. So this is a win-win situation. So this is what we should be thinking about our river system. Because it's, it not just ends with 200 million people of Pakistan, it also connects to Afghanistan. And another 20 million people can benefit from it. And then Afghanistan can actually connect to Central Asia and Western China, the biggest landlocked region in the world. They can establish inland ports for those countries. And imagine how the economy of Afghanistan will boom if they can provide this service and they, are, they can only provide this service if they cooperate with you. And when internationally you are benefiting your partners, your friends. And that is where the conflict starts ending because everyone is now getting benefited. And not just this, because then this part of the world, Northern India, it is also kind of a landlocked region. They don't have very nice access to the sea. And there, if you offer them, not today, but maybe 50 years from now, that you let the water flow in these tributaries and we will give you access down to the Arabian Sea, the peace would return in the region. So this is a win-win situation, a peaceful situation, environmentally friendly situation, and a huge boon to the economy. So what's wrong with this? Why don't we start thinking about it right now? So, thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, I guess uh, our last conference chat, do you want to have a Q&A session?